thanks everyone home for coming out tonight. Um, this is going to be my, my new talk I'm <coughs> doing for, uh, yeah, I don't know, next conferences, I guess. Um, and the topic is, um, well, I won't spoil the topic. Uh, the title of a, to uh, of a talk is uh, a common design language. And <coughs> we were talking about languages and not really uh, joking. So <coughs> let's start. Um, 7,097 I looked up today. That's the count of languages as of 2018, uh, human languages in the world. Um, some of them are weird. Um, this is for Yuho. Uh, some of them are even more weird. It's for all of you. Um, yeah, Schmetterling. And some of them are completely insane, yeah? So, so that made me think, uh, what is the language, right? Um, and I looked up um, the definition of a language. Um, the language is a system that consists of a development, acquisition, maintenance, and use of a complex system of communication. Kind of complex, but I, I, um, I, I made some emphasis for words I liked. Um, so it's a system uh, where's development. So I am a developer so, and I like systems, so I emphasize the words. But after that, I, I started looking for like all different languages. So I found like some dodgy language, for example, uh, like animal languages, right? Uh, and it's not really complex, right, if you look at it. And then I found like a cat language. It's much more complex, it goes down. But still, it's kind of not really what I was looking for. Um, and then I found that actually human language is completely different from all the languages um, uh, other creatures and species using um, in, in some fundamental, fundamental way. And the interesting part of this article for me was is that language provides us with a system, again system, right? Um, with a limited finite system of units that combine hierarchically and recursively into larger units. And it was like, hmm, interesting. And then I, I was like, okay, but where is this notion of, you know, this universal languages, right? Like, I don't know, like music. I love music. I, I listen to a shit ton of music. Um, and I, I studied music at some time point as I, was, as, a, as I was a child and it sucked at it and I quit it. Um, but still, I kind of can still a little bit understand what this shit is saying. Although I couldn't play it, but musicians who can play and uh, interpret shit music, they can basically independent of, of, of the origin of the language we speak, they can just read this and play on an infinite number of instruments. Which is kind of amazing for such a simple notation, right? There are not that many things going on. I mean, kind of, but it's much more simpler than a human language if you look, uh, if you, if you look at any like German language, right? And combinations are much more limited. Um, and then there is a design, and design language. And the design language, um, if we would simplify it kind of a little bit, uh, consists of typography, color, um, spacing, and all these three parts um, playing a crucial role in, in how we design, right? So how we perceive things. And together we form the, basically the, 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 the user experience of the product if we're talking about products, uh, digital products in, in, in this case, in case of this presentation. Um, so let's, like, like why, is it, why is it important, right? Like typography. So if you think of spacing and white space and all these uh, parameters uh, typography has, if you, if you look at these two examples, it's, it's clear this one is more legible, right? Because and here is no white space, so uh, white space is, is good, right? So, and consistent white space is even more important because it establishes with written uh, this, 
which you can easily scan the text. And this one doesn't have this written and it's, it's hard to read. Or let's take a color. Um, color is, is something uh, that we use to emphasize things or to bring to attention. And if you see uh, at this example from Material UI, uh, the low contrast, you basically you don't see the button because the button is the same color as, as a, uh, a header and there is no button anymore. Where on the second example where it's basically the opposite color, you, you instantly see and you, it focuses your attention on this button, right? The same goes with spacing. Uh, uh, spacing gives us structure when we design things. So if you don't use spacing right, where there's no structure in this document, and, and suddenly if you put the spacing uh, in right places, it's structured, it's easy to scan. So what design language does for us is not only it establishes a brand, um, it's also at consistency and improved accessibility of things we do with, uh, when we design them. So let's, let's take a look at this picture. So there are two screenshots I made recently. And one of them is Dropbox. So which one do you think is Dropbox here? Right, but it kind of looks the same, right? So if I, like I just removed the logos, but it's kind of the same service. So it's like how you can, I don't know if it was, if, if, if it was intentional or not, probably I was just part of A-B test. Um, they were trying out some, uh, but usually if you go to Yandex, they have all, all these yellow buttons, and suddenly it was like blue, like, like the same blue as Dropbox. And I was like, hey, come on. I, did I click the wrong link? No, what? So I'm at, am I at Dropbox.com right now? So you can be easily confused, and the brand is kind of, yeah, in, in this sense, it's, it's not a good for, for branding, right? And the second thing, like, it's consistency, right? Uh, and this is an example of all the buttons uh, the government, federal government of USA uh, uh, gathered when they did um, a research on how many different styles of buttons they have on, on all, all of the websites they have. And all of these buttons do the same exact thing, but they look completely different. And this might confuse people. Why it can be confusing? Because if you start changing these patterns you established, um, you basically you uh, break people's behavior because we humans are really good at recognizing these patterns and learning these patterns. So when we go to the website and we see this, uh, so we want to cancel a subscription and we see the, the yellow, the primary button is submit and cancel. So we click on it. On the next step, we don't even think about it. We click the same yellow button, but it's now it's a keeps on my subscription. And this is basically what uh, dark patterns are. They do nothing but break the, the flow of how you think, break your expectation in order to trick you into things you don't want. I don't know if it was intentional by Amazon. I think it was, but it just could possibly be a mistake of a, you know, a front-end engineer because you know, front-end is hard. And suddenly wears like this damage for a brand because the guy was like on Twitter, hey, this is a dark pattern and this is insane how Amazon can do such things and it's not good, right? Um, probably it was just a typo and a class name. Who knows? And then this accessibility thing, you know? Um, so you can basically do, uh, choose colors that are, aren't readable if you apply them to particular parts of your UI, uh, which is also kind of really important uh, if you want to make accessible products. Um, so it is important to follow all these things, but the main question for me is like, how do we, how do we enforce these things in, across the product, right? How do we make them consistent? And the answer to, to this uh, have been, and still is, design systems. Yeah? And design system, as a, as a design system defines a set of design-related rules as a system of instructions that can be reused across single or multiple products. Um, to me, a good example of like, great design system is Lego. Uh, and this is a set that comes in, in single package. It's like three in one. So basically, you can, this, this, the same set of uh, bricks, you can build three different cars. It's just like, seriously? How cool is that, right? It's an amazing design system, if you think of it. 
Um, another good example is government term, uh, German government versus Austrian government, uh, federal government logotypes. Uh, if you can clearly see there is a system in German design, so these things belong together. You don't even need to read them. I didn't read, I, I knew that I, this is something similar. Also, these things also the same, kind of similar, they look completely different because there is no design system. Every minister, ministerium does its, like they were designed by themselves or they just outsource to children, um, how it's usually done. So this is how design system looks like, right? So you go to one website of, of this multiple websites and they all look the same. Although this, this is completely different products or like parts of a bigger thing, you still, you, you recognize the same patterns. Why is it good? Because when the user learn how to use this one, they can go to the next one and use it kind of the same, same way they just learned. Um, and same thing, Austrian websites uh, for federal government, they look completely different. So if you, if you start just um, jumping off uh, one to another, you will see they, you have to learn, each, each time you have to learn how to use the website um, one more time, which isn't good uh, if you want to be uh, you know, consistent across all these uh, websites. Um, which brings me to the topic uh, that is really close to me. It's design system for digital products. Um, I think they have a problem. Um, I think the problem is that developers and designers, they speak different languages. So if we think of like what web developer is doing, um, yeah. So I'm usually doing this one, yeah, it's, it, it's a match. <laughs> um, we use these languages um, that aren't like easy or simple, although we think they are. Um, we make fun of people who think that HTML is is a programming language. Um, but it takes weeks to learn and years to master these languages. And I have probably, I don't know, like almost 20 years of experience right now uh, in working with web technologies. I, I started probably in 1999, something like this. Like poking around, not professionally, but well, when I, I, I started doing this professionally. So I, I've, seen, I've seen things and still I, when I need to center element on screen, I still have to go to, uh, to the cheat sheet or something and find out how to do this because it's, it's not simple. This is just flexbox, come on. Just one single feature of the CSS, which is simple. It's not, come on, take a look at it. It took me like, it's probably 20 megabyte picture. How is this simple? Um, and then where is this notion of um, like web designers thinking, yeah, first of all, they have these tools where they use lines and rectangles and you know, simple colors and gradients. Um, and they create beautiful pictures of user interfaces that have to be used in, on shit tons of devices. And they kind of assume, oh, yeah, okay, the developers, they will figure it out how to you know, make it responsive or how to you know, make all the states connected and like all these possible states of this all possible UIs, it's, it's gonna be all right. And then there is this question like, should designers code? You know, it would be great if you would just code and not design, you know? And the same way designers are like, hey, come on, developers, you should just you know, do design and it's gonna be all right. And what I found out is in real products, we actually, we don't think in like lines and rectangles or HTML markup and CSS class names. We think of these things, you know, we see, this, we, see, we see the things on screen and it's like, it's a list of, you know, some cards elements, yeah? And one card element has like this button, this avatar thing, some text, some icon. <coughs> so we think in these components kind of, you know, both designers and developers. So if we, if we talk to each other like, hey, the button is kind of offset a little bit, right? They don't say us, hey, this rectangle with rounded corners, this blue color is offset. They say button. And they also kind of, when, we, when they speak back, they go like, hey, it's a button. Yeah, it's, 
the button is offset. It's not HTML tag button with two class names applied, right? So we kind of, we, we, we have this abstraction in mind both, but we still kind of not connected. Um, yeah, components, like that's the cool thing, right? So what are, what are components? Components are the small things the Compose user interfaces from. And components can have multiple variances. And this is what makes components hard. Um, because all this, well, different states and different uh, behaviors. But the cool thing about components, although each of them have multiple variances, we can combine pretty much unlimited, um, infinite number of uh, UIs if we use these components, right? This login form, this error field, you can clearly see the pattern, right? Or we can take the same components library and, and create a search toolbar. And the best thing about it is it, it's consistent, so it's the same button. And the idea it has been around for a decade right now. So this is a screenshot from BAM. Uh, I don't know how many people use BAM and know what BAM is, but it, this is one of the methodologies uh, how to organize CSS for two components. And they did components back then, so like all the Russian internet built with components these days. Everybody, everyone uses it. Or like, take a look at native platforms. They also have been using components. They, they, they didn't have this problem. So they, from the beginning on, they, they were using components, and it's, it's gone, it was all right. And now you can even, like, if you download Sketch, the latest version, you have an iOS I, UI design components built in, into the design tool. Just like, whew, cool. Probably I installed it just out of curiosity. But it, this is a cool thing, right? You just, so it's kind of the same. And components, if you start combining them in specific order, you can basically create lots of lots of different patterns. So this is the same components here, but the patterns are uh, different. So what, what, are, what are patterns, right? Um, a design pattern is a reusable form of solution to a design problem. And um, the idea of design patterns was introduced by Christopher Alexander, who is an architect and has been adapted by lots of disciplines, and most notably by uh, computer um, science. So the, like, all the component-driven approach in computer science is based on this book, basically, on his, on his ideas. Um, which is kind of insane, I guess, but this is how it is. Um, and in UI design, they have been using uh, uh, patterns for, for a longer time as well. It's pretty much all websites called uipatterns.com. They have uh, a collection of different UI patterns. This one, for example, and patterns have a specific structure, like they, they describe this problem, they, have, they, they, have a, they show you an example, and they show you when to use and when not to use, and they link to uh, related patterns, so you can nav navigate between these patterns before you find the right one for your use case. Um, um, yeah, patterns can be really specific to applications. Um, for example, this is an uh, input suggestion list, which is kind of, you know, you won't use it in any application, but at Feedly we, we, crea like we created this pattern because it was uh, being reused on like multiple, in, uh, uh, multiple screens and uh, it made sense to, to, to do it. But basically it, it also composed from labels and input elements and some lists. Um, so, yeah, components and patterns are a great way to communicate and suitable for both designers and developers and many others, actually. And they solve particular design problems. And the cool thing about them is, is they are reusable. But still somehow we manage to, I don't know, like to, to have this inconsistency in our UIs, right? So that made me thinking, like, what is the missing link here? So if we have this kind of... It's already kind of a common language, but somehow we, something is missing. And I think the, the thing, what is missing is, um, is that at the end of the day, we still, like each of these groups, like designers still have to go and design stuff in Sketch or Figma using like this paradigm, <coughs> right? And, and developers, they still have to do stuff in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript because it should be run in, in, the, in the browser. And, these things kind of not really connected. So I was like, hmm, interesting. What if we could um, merge these things together and establish a real like, common language for both groups? 
And I think this thing called primitives, and it's also been around for, as an idea for quite a while, not, not that long as components, but still, uh, it's not something I just made up. And what are primitives? Um, so let's take a look at, again at our component library, it's just super simple. Um, so this is a button, and the button can have different variants. Let's say um, it's default actually primary. So before React, <laughs> you know how it goes, right? It's a React Vienna meetup. Um, but I think that's important. Before, we, we, we've been using stuff like BAM and object-oriented CSS and SMUX uh, to organize the code into components. Um, but still, we would be doing something like this. Designer would come in and say, hey, uh, give me default button, tetri button, and primary button, they should look like this. And then developer should do a choice, you know, should have a choice. Like, uh, should be button, or should be input type button, or should be, should I just use def, right? because I don't care, I, like, I don't give a shit. And for each of this, he would be, and all of this would look like button on screen because, yeah, I mean, why, right? And the problem, if you start having this lots of choices, it's suddenly like you build from these blocks kind of, but it doesn't fit really, right? Um, and then like React appeared and actually like pioneered how we do components on that, right? So the idea is like, is, is all in other frameworks right now. But the, the way we did it in React was like, okay, we just encapsulated it. Everything is a component no matter what, right? So, and it has this lifecycle methods and, and it's clear how it works, it's easy to read. And we put HTML in it and everyone hates it or half people, half 50% hates and then 50% loves it because it's easier to read. You just go in and you kind of, you got what you, you know what you will get. And, but it also changed a lot in how we think about user interfaces because um, now when designer comes in and says, hey, I, I still want default Tetrian primary buttons from you uh, and developer, hey, hold my beer. Yeah, you got it. You, like button, button, tetrian, but even designer could write it, right? It's like, hey, cool. It's pretty much the same as what he wants. How cool is that? But hey, Andre, why would we, you know, we have this in the HTML already. It's bullshit. You don't like, we have this. But the thing is, the button and button aren't the same. So if, if, if it looks the same, but it, it's still not because the, the difference is that this one is an HTML element that is HTML element that lives in DOM that has its boundaries, DOM boundaries. And this one is a React component. And you can do pretty much everything in the React component. And the cool thing about it is, is um, yeah, so, and the problem with the button element is that CSS suddenly becomes semantic. So without the class name BTN, the whole thing will won't just look like a button like we wanted it to look, it still would probably act as a button, but it will look like shit. And our designer will kill us. So what's the point? Semantic HTML, I just showed you. You can, you can use diff and still apply the button. It will, it will be a button. And it, in, it will probably even work. So yeah, <laughs> who cares? Nobody reads HTML anyways these days, right? And CSS, OK, yeah, OK. Not, just don't let me start. And my, my thing is like um, what I think is important is then the design requirements are changing. It's like, hey, let's update all the buttons quickly. Yeah, okay, you will say, uh, or some people might say, okay, it's CSS, but yeah. Um, alter the, 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 the component button, we can establish this contract, right? So it's like it's strict contracts with prop types. We can type them, we can use flow type, TypeScript, or just prop types, and still get the warnings if we don't use the right one and the CSS and the HTML suddenly isn't, aren't here because it's an implementation now so we don't use them as an API which is an important part of what I'm trying to say. So I'm, I'm not talking about implementation, I'm talking about the API to, to what the uh, component library user would see. And again, we found the bug in a button. I mean, it's simple, but still we found the bug, we fucked it up. 
How do, we, how do we fix the bug? We go into the button, we don't touch any line of the application code, and it's, yeah. So and basically, um, the same applies to, I don't know why, like suddenly, like I often see this, that people start, like they, they understand the button example, but here we're like, no, 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 no. That is bullshit, like button, okay, you, you like, we buy it, the button, the, we buy it. But this, no, this is too, this is too complex. We have cascade, it's good. Same applies to headings, right? No heading, like why would we need a React component for heading? We have H1, it's amazing, H1. Um, yeah, the problem is it probably is gonna work if you're building a website, but this, uh, applications when you nest things and you don't know how you nest things when you do components, right? If you have a H tag in a component, it might end up in the not the proper order or not the proper part of the DOM tree and some cascade rules might apply and suddenly everything is bad again. And um, this kind of, the API which establishes this typographic scale um, and you still have semantic so you can kind of you can do both but in a predictable way now or same goes to text um, instead of having like okay what uh, font size uh, should I use for this smaller text now or what margin should it have you just say okay this is a text which is a secondary text and my designer defined it for me and I I don't want to know what, what properties of this text are, I'm just using it. I just want it to, to look the same way as it looks on a different, different screen. So that's kind of the point of these primitives. Um, one more thing about primi HTML primitives is where to few of them, if you, if you look at HTML5, where plenty of tags, but still, if you think of primitives we use in our UIs, it's kind of, it's lacking. And probably text is gonna work, it's pay, right? It's paragraph or span, I don't know. Um, heading, yeah, okay, cool. H1, H6, we, HTML got us covered. So we have links, uh, A, href, okay, works. Um, and then there's a button. It's like nobody knows where two ways of doing buttons in HTML, but you know, where are two ways? Uh, we're actually free because if submit button, it's, it's type submit, but yeah, okay. Um, and then it was like, hey, can you do a drop down quickly? Oh, yeah, sure, wait a minute. What, drop down, no. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's not that. And you start the simple things like tokens, design tokens, colors, where shit tons of different uh, uh, um, style guides out there, so you can get lots of inspiration just by looking around. I, I, I made some screenshots. So what goes into tokens? Everything that is basically wearable in CSS or SAS can go into the token. Everything that is reusable, they have even like timing for, uh, because you want your uh, motion also be consistent, right? You don't want your team to be figuring out, hey, should it be half a second or quarter of a second this time? Um, just use this variable, right? Um, so we also have like just a list of all the tokens we have. And, and then you have these components, right? So you, you document all the components, all the possible states, all the possible variations of them. And the important thing here is you document when to use which type, because this is uh, what people will be looking at. And thinking, okay, what, what should I use now? Should it be primary or should it be success? Yeah. Um, and it should be kind of explained, so this one is probably not the best example because it kind of likes the explanation be why, why were so many um, colors. Um, and examples. Um, examples are really crucial because you can just basically uh, copy and paste it into your code and it, it's gonna work. Um, yeah, many different uh, Component, um, component libraries or uh, style guides out there. Um, I collected a couple of them, but there are much more, uh, much, much more of them out there. Um, and I, I, I told about like what's uh, good style guides share 
uh, in common, right? And I think they all should serve a common ground for designer developers, project managers, everyone who works in the project. So it shouldn't be, it should be the source of uh, knowledge about the, the, the user interface. So this is why I don't think that if you just pull in Bootstrap or Undesign, it's gonna work because everyone now has to go to the Undesign documentation and okay, which one of these buttons we using and why. Um, so it should be specific to the company, specific to the product. It should be easy to use, it should have good structure, relevant content. Um, the style guide is the documentation, so it's not, it shouldn't be leaving separate. It shouldn't be like, we have a documentation in Wiki, but here is a style guide. It's the same thing. And it should be easy to create and maintain, because if it's not, nobody will maintain it anymore. And it should be always up to date. So there are lots of lots of style guides out there that aren't up to date. And if you look at them and you look at the product, uh, come, wait a minute, what, what happened here? So why do we even have a style guide in the first place, right? If, it's, if you can't keep it up to date. Um, this is what I call component-driven development. This is what makes it possible. Um, so basically it's a process. Um, it looks kind of like this. So you have this single theme.js or it can be CSS, whatever, or YAML file where you store your tokens and uh, all the uh, required things. And, and this is the product, right? So this thing depends on, on, on this thing. Um, but at the same time, so when you change this, you also generate a new style guide. So it should be, it should be in parallel because it also allows things like adding stuff into this pipeline, right? Or creating a new product. So if you have a design system for federal government, you have to have a shared knowledge somewhere. And if you update one thing, everything should, all of other things should be updated automatically. Um, and this is what I'm trying to, to do. So this is what I'm, me, Artyom Sapegin, and me are teaching. So this is a shameless plug. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, a, an advertisement for workshops. Um, because I think, um, where's this study? It says, our interest may have developed a primitive form of language in order to teach it, each other to make stone tools. If you remove stone and primitive, it's like we speak to each other to teach something, you know? And if we have this common language, um, it's, it's great because we can now communicate efficiently. And I think that happened with web developments, like we, um, we, we mistakenly prioritize this idea of universal reuse because HTML and CSS is kind of, kind of universal. We can use it everywhere. This, like basically we put the technology uh, before the language we speak to each other. And I think that this is a mistake. So we have to go a little bit back and probably compromise a little bit on technology and say, okay, yeah, we use the specific technology, but now we have this clearer way to communicate because technology is much easier to iterate on because you can, you can remove technology and exchange it with another one. But the language and like this foundation stuff is super hard to, you know, to exchange. It's probably even not impossible. And yeah, this is uh, everything I have for you tonight. And it took me 41 minutes and 30 seconds, which is good. Uh, I didn't know how much it'll take me. Thank you.